Right, well we were here the other day, this is Hall of Clestron, and uh, this is what it looked like in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, the house that you saw was a bit more dilapidated than, than that now, but originally it was built in uh, 1769, and it belonged to the Honeyman uh, family who owned the island of Grimsey, so they were known as the Honeymoons of Grimsey. Um, but they ended up, Lord Armadale, uh, one of the Honeymoons, ended up being a law lord in Edinburgh. So he never came up to Orkney, but he appointed a man called John Ray, who came from Lanarkshire, uh, as the factor for the estate. So he moved north, and he lived in the house here. Uh, the roof, as you can see there, is slated. The roof came off it in 1952 during a hurricane, uh, but that's another story. So this is where Ray was born on the 30th of September, 1813. And when he was just under a year old, they had a visit from Walter Scott, the writer. This was before he was Sir Walter Scott. He was just plain ordinary. Watty Scott at that time. Uh, but he, he visited and had uh, a meal with uh, Ray's father. And Ray said that he remembered the visit, you know, very well, even though he was like 11 months old. Uh, and I mean, maybe he did have a memory of it, but he did say that he'd heard so much about it that it was probably just he created the images in his mind, you know, having had so much. Now, he was one of six children, and he was extremely active. Um, he was the sort of uh, person that would, he would go on extreme hikes. In fact, he would go on extreme hikes on steroids, you know. He, he, was, he walked all day. He had a phenomenal uh, stamina. And since he was a very small boy, he uh, started to hunt, to hunt birds for the table. And he was, he recalls that he was given uh, an old flintlock musket when he was five. And he said the barrel of it was as thin as a sixpence. But he, uh, he learned to, to hunt, to shoot. He was an extremely good shot and he spent all of his time outdoors, walking around the hills in Orford. Now in Orkney, uh, you saw a little bit of it. This is the west coast of Orkney. It's a place called Yesnaby. So you can get rocky cliffs, but mostly it's that sort of green, fertile land. But in 1813, it wouldn't have been quite as green as that. It was before an agricultural revolution. So a lot of uh, hill land, a lot of heather, a lot of just brown grass, moorland. And, uh, but ideal for, for hunting. And like I said, it was for the family table. Uh, he, would, he would hunt basically anything with feathers that you could eat, including heron as well. Now, he decided to study to be a doctor. So he went to Edinburgh, and then he decided to change courses, because uh, if you became a surgeon, you could qualify a year earlier than if you became a, a, a doctor. So he, you were meant to qualify at 20. He was 19 when he qualified. Uh, he would have been 20 later that year. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really fancy having a 19-year-old rootling around inside me, you know, pulling up bits going, is this needed? <laughs> can, can we I've got lots of bits left over, you know. Um, no disrespect to 19-year-olds, but it was just um, uh, strange that that was, that you could have a, a, an occupation like that so young in those days. And when he went to Edinburgh, it was just at the time, just after a scandal, because there was a couple of lads called Burke and Hare. I don't know if you heard of these guys. They always get called grave robbers. They, they were never grave robbers. They never robbed a grave in their life because they didn't need to. Uh, Hare's, Hare and his wife had a, a boarding house 
and they discovered it was much easier to murder people and sell their bodies to uh, Edinburgh University for the medical department for dissection. So they always made sure that they, these were not local people. They had no family in the area. They were just moving through. And um, Buck was the guy that did the, did the killing. Hare would get them drunk first, and then they would murder them. And I'd take them up to a guy called Dr. Knox, who uh, had uh, made it known that if they should happen to come by a body, just like like you do from time to time, you know, and think, how are we going to tidy this up? Uh, then uh, he said that they would pay good money for it. There was a, a little uh, skipping rhyme in Edinburgh at the time that the Burns had, and it said, went, Oh, I should explain that a close is a lane and a button bend was the sort of two rooms of the house, the best room and, and the living area. So it just describes that. And it goes, uh, doing the close and up the stair, button bend with burk and hair, burk's the butcher, the hair's the thief, Knox is the boy that buys the beef. So this was Dr. Knox. Um, and they got caught, but I mean, even though they had a body uh, in the house uh, ready to go, they still didn't have enough evidence. So they got uh, Hare to turn uh, King's evidence for on Buck. And so he was hanged. And ironically, as a, a hung criminal, he was given to Edinburgh University for dissection. And his skeleton can still be seen in the Surgeon's Museum in Edinburgh. Uh, Hare did a runner because he was basically driven out of town and so did Knox. He went to London, got a better paid job, was a very respectable man. So Ray's become a doctor. He returns to Strumness. Uh, this is a, a print from um, around 1819, so not that many years after. He, uh, uh, Ray was, was born, and it's a small village there. That was the recruiting area for the Hudson's Bay Company. You signed on to the ships there, and Ray's father was an agent. That is Stromness in, in Orkney. Yeah, this is this is where me and Rhonda live, which is, which is behind the big building there. Interestingly enough, when William Daniels did this this uh, original drawing to turn into a, an engraving. The big ship that's lying there, the big tall masted ship, is the Prince of Wales. That's the Hudson Bay Company recruiting ship. And that's uh, took, they recruited three quarters of the workforce from Orkney. And uh, they, uh, many of them married and stayed in, in Canada. So there's a, a lot of First Nation people with names like Fleck, Looted, Ice Pister, you know, all Orkney names. So, Reza al he's 19, he's just qualified as a surgeon. He needs a summer job, and his dad says, Why don't you sign on to the ship as the ship's surgeon? Go over to Hudson Bay, they land in James Bay at Moose Factory, and then you can just, you know, come back uh, in September. And, uh, and you'll be back at home in Orkney in time for your birthday on the 30th. It didn't quite work out like that though. They got to James Bay, and in, which is at the south end of Hudson's Bay, and uh, the ice came early that year, and so they were iced in and uh, unable to get away. Now Ray uh, discovered that he really liked this place. There was a lot of hunting to do, so he signed on to remain there as the surgeon in the area uh, for 10 years. And he went about learning how to hunt in Canada, uh, which was maybe slightly different from in Orkney. But he met a man called George Rivers. George Rivers was a Cree First Nation man who had had a severe injury of his back, so he he walked sort of bent doubled, but he was a crack shot and a great hunter, and he taught Ray 
how to build little stone hides, like a little crescent of stone that you hide behind for shooting. He taught me things like when you get a family of geese coming over, you shoot the parents first, and then the young ones will just fly round and round and round in a circle above their parents' bodies, and you can pick them off one by one. Uh, bad news if you're a goose, but good news if you're hungry and like goose. So he, uh, he learned these things. He also learned how to walk on snowshoes, which was something completely unknown of for him, of course. And um, he discovered how to use the small sleds that people pulled as well. So he had snowshoes, sleds, he could travel. And uh, <clears throat> he learned how to make snowshoes because it was always the women that made the snowshoes. And it was regarded as being a bit weird that Ray, as a man, would make snowshoes. But he did point out what happens if I'm miles from any woman and my snowshoe breaks. You know, I need to know how to fix it. So he was a man that uh, was able to look after himself. Now, this is him in his uh, early years. Um, with a very sort of Napoleonic stance. So he ended up uh, the, the surgeon in this uh, area and there was a man, uh, another Scotsman called uh, Sir George Simpson who was the overall governor of the Hudson's Bay Company known as Little Napoleon to, to some I believe, not to his face mind you of course and uh, so he was uh, in, he wanted the Hudson's Bay Company to map the last remaining parts of the Arctic coast rather than the Royal Navy, just purely for kudos for the Hudson's Bay Company. And he saw Ray, he saw that he had adapted to local technology, local techniques. Uh, he wasn't prejudiced in any way against First Nations people and would learn from them, which was unusual for Europeans in those days. And, uh, but also he noted his incredible stamina. This is a man that could snowshoe for tens of miles. So he was sent with another Arcadian called William Corrigal, another lad from Orpha, same as Ray, they were sent to the Red River <clears throat> settlement to learn how to survey and make maps. They had to get there, mind you, and it was about 1,500 miles that they went on foot, on snowshoes, and by canoe. And they got to the place, and the, the man that was going to teach them how to survey was on his deathbed. So that was that. I mean, the man died and they were no nearer learning how to make maps than they had been when they started. So, not knowing what to do and obviously not able to just pick up a phone and say, where would you like us to go now? They decided to set off on their own initiative and, uh, and walk to uh, Toronto. So they walked from the Red River Settlement to uh, Toronto, another huge undertaking. Um, but he was so successful at living off the land, they didn't carry the provisions with them, they hunted on the way, that he said that he actually put on about six pounds on his voyage, on his travels from Red River to, uh, to Toronto. He put, he put on weight. Um, so he got his training and he was sent off to um, do some mapping in, of the Arctic coast, which meant traveling by canoe. They, but they also used modern technology as well. He had a Halkett cloth boat, which was a bit like our Zodiacs, only much smaller. And uh, I, I, when I have faith in zodiacs, although I realize that those things could bite you if you get on the wrong side of them, you know, I'm, I'm not a confident person on, on the sea, to be honest, but they're safe. 
whereas this was actually canvas covered with uh, with rubber and um, what he had to do seems it was frozen you know because they were in the Arctic they had to warm them up by a fire first to get pliable and then he had a pair of bellows and he had to pump like mad to get the air into it but it was extremely uh, it was extremely effective and he traveled from as you can see down here in the south the, the black line here in Churchill up there to Repulse Bay and uh, Fort Hope and then up Boothia which was thought to be an island at the time but in fact it was a peninsula and it was Ray that discovered that it was actually a peninsula rather than an island. This is a later uh, painting of Ray dressed in a variety of First Nation costumes. It's not all one First Nation, there's, there's a bit of a mixture of everything. But he discovered that, you know, they were, um, they knew what they were doing. They had been in the Arctic for many tens of thousands of years and had survived. And so therefore they were, they knew how to adapt to the environment and that is, and he had the wisdom to listen to them and learn from them how to adapt as well. One of the, um, when he got up into the Arctic, he met Inuit, and uh, he also was open to learning from them as well. This is a photograph taken in the 1920s by a man from uh, Shetland, who was up on, I think, Baffin Island, and there are the Inuit women in the traditional costumes. But he, um, he did, the one big mistake he made in the Arctic was he, he built a button bend. <laughs> he built a stone house, the same as he saw in Orkney. And this is the remains of it, it's called Fort Hope. Uh, so they built this stone building uh, they didn't have a proper roof for it, so they used sailcloths or canvas roof with oars across it. And uh, he separated a little quarter off for himself with a blanket, not because he was in charge and wanted to um, show authority by being in one end and the men in the other, but it's because he was the only non-smoker in the group. Uh, he didn't like smoking and pipe smoke annoyed him. So all the guys sat puffing away in the one end, and he'd be in the other end with his books and such like, avoiding the smoke. Now, uh, the thing is, when you build a stone house in the Arctic, uh, you've, you're basically building a fridge. And if there's one thing that you don't need in the Arctic, it's a fridge. Uh, well, not to live in. And uh, so, the, it was freezing cold. They had a fire in the gable end, like they did in Orkney, and all the heat was sucked up that chimney and gone. So the one day, there was a group of Inuit had moved into the area, and he went to visit them, and he was invited into their homes, into the snow house, their igloo. And he discovered that his jacket, which had been frozen solid for three weeks, started to defrost. And that it was actually warm in there, and compared to what he had been used to in Fort Hope, um, it, was, it was a luxury. So he said, how do you build these? So they showed him the correct snow to use. You can't just use any snow when you're building an igloo, you need to have snow that has got a lot of air trapped in it for insulation. So he learned how to build them. You also, you don't just put one block on top of the other. It's a spiral that rises up and goes round and round like a snail shell up to the top. So he learned how to do that. But then he thought, ha, ah, I can make an adaptation and make this better. I'll cover it with water and then that'll, that'll freeze and I'll keep out any drafts. And the Inuit said to him, no, no, don't do that. You'll make the house cold. And he said, what do you mean? And he said, that will freeze and that will turn it into a, a fridge. It'll be Fort Ray Mark II. 
you don't want that. It it'll completely destroys the purpose of it. You need that air in the snow in order to insulate and to keep it warm. So he uh, he learned a valuable lesson that you don't cover your snow house with uh, with water and ice. So he mapped that piece of coastline. Uh, he returned back to London and uh, this was in 1846-47. He came back to London. He wrote an account of his journey. Everybody was into polar exploration at that time. The Royal Navy had decided that they were going to find the last link in the elusive um, and mythical Northwest Passage that they could have a shortcut to India and China. And uh, <clears throat> so Ray wrote his account. He had a book published and he was fated in London. The, the newspapers all loved him. He was a celebrity. He was talk of the town. Now, the year before he'd set off on expedition, this slim gentleman here uh, had set off. This is Sir John Franklin. As you can see, a, a fine, slender figure of a man. Uh, in reality, this is a daguerreotype photograph of him that was taken just before he left. And uh, he had made a name for himself with Arctic exploration in the past. And he, um, he had returned from Tasmania under cloud. He was governor of Tasmania. And basically, he was stitched up by a local large landowner in Tasmania uh, because he was stopping prisoners from being used as unpaid labor, basically slaves. Uh, so he was actually very liberal and very forward thinking. And when he was heading out to the, uh, the over the Atlantic to the Davis Strait to begin the, the journey. Um, this is two scenes of his ships, the Erebus and the Terror. There they are. Um, he uh, he set and off to, like I said, try to discover this this elusive Northwest Passage. But under a bit of a cloud. Now he was not the natural selection for being the leader of the expedition but his wife Jane and his second wife uh, was an extremely ambitious woman and seems he had been withdrawn taken back from Tasmania under a cloud um, then she needed to rehabilitate his reputation and she pushed and had many friends in high places that could uh, help him on the get the command of the expedition. So they set off uh, into the Arctic. This is an illustration from a book that was in the house when I was born, when I was up there, and I used to sit and stare at this and imagine what it would be like in the Arctic. I've been there since then, and it didn't look anything like that. <laughs> See, these, these cathedrals of icicle bedecked uh, um, icebergs uh, only exist in the imagination of Victorian illustrators who have never been further west than possibly Devon and uh, so but this shows the Erebus and terror in the ice now by the time that Ray got back there was starting to be concern that the Franklin expedition had not shown up where it was expected in the Pacific uh, and Sir John Richardson, who was a friend of Franklin and who had travelled with Franklin on the first expedition, um, he swore to his friend that he would, if there was any problems, he would come and look for him. He would save him. And he set off, and he had Ray as his second in command because he'd read about this guy that could walk for miles in snowshoes and could do all these superhuman uh, feats of endurance and he thought that's the guy we need. So he was, um, he was drafted to join a Royal Navy expedition as the second in command and you can see the red lines here, they travel up 
the Mackenzie River up to the Arctic and along there. And um, Richardson ended up returning to London, leaving Ray in charge. So Ray just carried on uh, doing some mapping, but they found no evidence of Franklin at all. Now, as I said, Ray lived off the land. But another aspect to his nature as well was that he, he was a conservationist before there was such a concept as conservation. He wouldn't allow his men to hunt deer if they didn't need one. If they had enough meat, you left them. Because indiscriminately slaughtering and caching meat, he learned how to cache meat from the Inuit as well. Um, under big piles of rocks. The only thing that could disturb that would be a bear or another human. But then you were very scrupulous about leaving somebody else's food to cash. Uh, they didn't steal. And so he always made sure that there was more food cooked than necessary so that if any Inuit came by, he could give them, invite them in for a meal. He said to William Corrigal, who he was traveling with, that. Um, it was, it was the Orkney way. He always had a bite of food for anybody that happens to be passing by, coming to the house. You bring them in, you give them something to eat. And uh, that's certainly how I was brought up. So, but he never allowed you to hunt more, have more meat than you actually needed to use. He said that other hunters, you know, Inuit families who were trying to provide for their kids, they needed that meat more than them. And also the animals had to have the chance to reproduce and their numbers to increase, which is not gonna happen if you go blasting everyone that you happen to see. So there's just a wee photograph from the 20s as well of snow houses and the dog sleighs that was used by the Inuit. Ray did use dogs sometimes, but generally he just went on foot or by canoe or that halkett cloth boat. Now, he was going on a third expedition back, which is the blue area here. This is all the little dates down there, 1848-49 for the search for Ray. Um, this was 1850-51 on foot and by boat. And uh, so again, he's mapping more of the coastline that's not been found. Now, Lady Franklin has become friends with Ray. And there is a lot of, you know, talk about there being animosity between Ray and Franklin and all. Complete and utter rubbish. I could have inserted another word in there, but I shan't because I know that you may be of a delicate disposition. So, um, <clears throat> the, um, there was no animosity between Franklin and Ray. In fact, it was quite the opposite. The last night that John Franklin spent on British soil was in Strumness at the house of Dr. John Hamilton, who was married to Marion Ray, who was John Ray's sister. And they also dined with John Ray's mother. Now, Lady Franklin had given a, a lovely gun to Ray with a silver inscription, a plate on it with an inscription. Um, and she pinned her hopes on this young man of being able to find out what happened to her husband. She asked if he could keep an eye out for him on their travels, and he said, no, I'm going far too, I'm far too far east for that, because they were expecting the Franklin expedition to be over there somewhere where they were searching that western area. Um, but during that expedition, he found a piece of wood. It was a, a teak flagstaff that contained a piece of cloth fastened to it, just a tattered remnant, but obviously of a white ensign, a British flag. And also, just to clinch the deal, it had the broad arrow cut into the, the flagstaff. Now, broad arrows were put on everything that belonged to the British military, whether it was army, air force, navy. They had this uh, this arrow, which was just oh, like a 
point cross up there with a, a small shaft coming down from it. And um, they thought that this might be from the ships, but then they thought they were just too far, too far east. They should be further west. So it was rather overlooked and dismissed. Now, in 1853-54, he sets off on his fourth and final expedition. So he travels here, you can see the orange line, up there, and he establishes that this island here, King William Island, was actually an island. It was done on the maps as being King William Land because they thought it was a peninsula. But he discovered that it was a piece of uh, piece of land and that this area here, he actually, I have another slide. Um, so he's established at Boothy as a peninsula and King William Land, as you can see there, was King William Island. And this was the piece of water that he found down there, Ray Strait which had some ice in it, but it was young ice that was forming, so he knew that it had been open sea earlier. Now, when he was on his way, that, that ended up being the only navigable route in the Northwest Passage uh, at that moment in time. And that was the route that Amundsen took at the beginning of the 20th century and, and was the first man to successfully take a ship through the Northwest Passage. So, that was through Ray's discovery. Now, um, while he was on his way outwards, he met an Inuk called Inuk Puzichuk. And there was something a bit different about him because he noticed that on his fur cap, there was a piece of ribbon that was gold colored. Now, gold ribbon is not usually attributed to Inuit outfits. Uh, so he, he asked them, where did you get that? And he said, oh, it was traded with somebody else. So they said, well, where did you get it from? Because he recognized it as being a Royal Naval cap badge, or cap band, I should say. And he said, well, oh, from the, the boat place where the, the white men died. And realizing that he was referring to the Franklin expedition, he asked for more information. He couldn't really tell him much because um, he hadn't seen it himself. He'd only heard this from other people. Now, Ray asked him to send the word out that if they would gather down at uh, Pelly Bay, um, he would be going through that way on his way home. Uh, and. If anyone had any more artifacts from the boat place where the white men died, to bring them along, and he would pay them for it. So, <clears throat> when he got back to Pelly Bay, there was a whole horde of Inuit there, all with pieces from the Franklin expedition. I mean, they had forks and knives with the crests of Sir John Franklin and the senior uh, crew members on it. They had a medal that belonged to John Franklin, a silver tray with John Franklin's name on it, you know, inscribed to him, a gift to him. There was no disputing where this had come from. It was not from anywhere else. And there was no other naval ships in the area anyway that that could have come from. Although Lady Franklin was insisting that they had to, uh, you know, the Navy had to send out more and more search parties. So <clears throat> he was working with a man called uh, William Olegbuck. Now Olegbuck's father, old Olegbuck, used to be, uh, he was raised translator. And William was, uh, was old Olegbuck's son. And he was a particularly gifted translator because he could talk different uh, Inuit dialects so he was able to communicate with people from different nations and he would ask that you know Ray would ask the questions he would translate it and then he would translate the answer and the answers were all the same a group of white men were dragging a boat over King William Island and 
some of the Inuit had spoken to them, some gave them some seal meat, which was all that they could spare, but it was a hard time and there was no food to be able to share with them. Uh, they had f kind of fled from the area to avoid them because these were strangers in the land who were obviously in extreme difficulty and they only had enough food to provide for their own immediate family. They didn't have extra food to give to, the, uh, to these strangers. They had <clears throat> shot later uh, and they, they thought that they were hunting uh, geese that were flying over. And they did actually find goose feathers on the shore where they had been plucking geese. Um, but they had gone back then later after the winter to see if any of them were still alive, but they were all dead. And when they looked into the kettles, into the little cooking pots, they found that the last remaining survivors had resorted to cannibalism, uh, eating the bodies of their fallen dead comrades. Uh, this made the Inuit put a taboo on the area. You would not travel in there. It was believed to have spirits in there that were angry and dangerous. And so they wouldn't go back there. Now, Ray had only lost one man on his four trips and that was just a, a sheer accident. The guy was trying to be a bit too of a, much of a show off crossing a river in spate and lost his footing and fell in and was drowned. A guy called Albert One Eye, who was a matey. And um, so Ray's companions on this journey, um, one was showing signs of scurvy, another had frostbite, and he said, you know, we've got to get these guys back. We, we can't overwinter in the Arctic again another year because they'll start losing men. And if these guys have, they, by this time they've been dead for five years, so there's no point in rushing back. So, um, but when he got back to Britain, it was, of course, the whole Franklin expedition was the talk of the town. There was all this artwork. So when the story came out, you know, you've got these sort of heroic um, portraiture being produced by Victorian artists. Now, what happened next was somewhat unfortunate because Ray had, um, he had written a report, a full report on his findings for the Admiralty and the Hudson's Bay Company. He also wrote a version of events for the Times newspaper that made no mention of cannibalism. He knew that it happened in the Arctic. He had heard the stories and he knew how desperate people could get with hunger, with starvation, and that nobody knows how they would react unless they found themselves in that position. You can't say, well, I would never do that. You'd be surprised what you would be capable of doing if you were in desperate situations. But he didn't want the families to be upset by this because obviously he had no idea who these people were it was just people from the expedition and um, so he didn't mention uh, anything about cannibalism unfortunately the admiralty released his full report unedited to the times and of course that was the big headline was cannibalism um, lady franklin was furious to say the least she was trying to rehabilitate her husband's reputation. Here he was led an expedition that had not only failed, but had cost the lives of 130 men. And then there was the whole taint of cannibalism attached to it as well. And she was um, furious. There was a reward posted there. 20,000 was for helping any survivors of the Franklin expedition. Um, the 10,000 was for bringing any news, and Ray was able to bring that news back. Um, he was asked to lead another expedition to go to the Arctic and to confirm what had happened. But he said that he was wanting to settle down in Mari, he was by this time 
a man of about 40 or so, and uh, he said that, you know, his days in the Arctic was, was over. And he did go to Toronto and he married um, uh, this woman here, uh, Catherine Thompson, uh, just known as Kate to him. And um, they spent the rest of their lives together and seemed to have an extremely loving relationship. But they had no family. So uh, Ray's line uh, it didn't run out because I'm still friends with uh, Jane Hamilton, who was a descendant of his sister, uh, his sister uh, Marion, and her husband, Dr. John Hamilton. Now, um, the reason why he didn't go back, now this has been argued about quite a bit because um, there was a, an Inuit politician called Taga Curley uh, whose ancestors were guides for Ray. And he said that Ray was scared of the ghosts that might be in the area from the Franklin expedition. Uh, there was a taboo put on the area and so he was avoiding that. Now, we do know that he was very superstitious. Uh, he records being afraid at night sometimes when he heard an owl screech or whatever because, and he attributed that to having a highland nush when he was a, a boy. Like his, his nanny was a woman from the highlands that always told him ghost stories. And uh, the old storehouse at Clestron there uh, had a, a ghost story attached to it. And at night, sometimes you could see lights in the windows. They were actually smugglers signaling to a boat offshore that it was safe to land the cargo, but uh, he didn't know that. But he, he refused to go. Now, Lady Franklin, this is an image of her as a much younger woman. Um, she was absolutely furious that this story had been put out. Now, why was the story put out? My theory, uh, and this is purely my own thoughts, is I think that the Royal Navy were trying to shut her up. They were trying to, to shut her down because she had made their lives a misery for years. She had insisted that more and more expeditions be sent to the Arctic to search for, for her husband. She even, um, along with her, uh, her niece, uh, Sophia Craycroft, who was a bit like a, sort of a, a pet bull in a large frock, um, she, they, they had rented a house right opposite the Admiralty buildings and the Admiralty, the, they called it the Battery because it was like a place with cannons in it firing off letters at them the whole time. And I think that during that time as well, the, Crime, the Crimean War had just broken out. And the Royal Navy actually had a war to, to fight. They had to take an army out to Russia, well, Ukraine. And um, they didn't have time to send more and more ships to look for dead people. So she um, managed to finance another expedition led by Leopold McClintock. And McClintock went to see Ray, and, and Ray pointed out on the map, that's where the, that's where the boat place is, that's where you find it. So he went to the exact location that he was given by Franklin, and he did find the remains of the last, uh, of the Franklin expedition. Um, he also found the cairn that contained the only written information saying that Franklin had died in 1847. Uh, and I was just showing uh, a few, a few, a grave in St. Magnus uh, Cemetery uh, for a man called Thomas Work who came from the island of Shatlancy in Orkney and he was one of the crewmen on the Erebus and uh, he is down on the stone as dying in 1847. Well, how did they know that? I think it's just because that was the year that Franklin died and he would have obviously died before any of that cannibalism nonsense because he wouldn't allow it. Uh, that's the way that Lady Franklin looked at it, and uh, so to avoid any taint of cannibalism, they put this date on um, so that it, it exonerated him as well from being part of it. Now this guy enters the fray, Charles Dickens. He was the editor of a magazine called Household Words, 
and he printed a piece in it uh, in response to Ray's um, report to the Admiralty that was published in the Times, where he says that, you know, Ray, um, he didn't hold any animosity against Ray, he thought he had done a fine job, and he can take his rest now, well-deserved rest, like a good Englishman, he said. I suspect that there was a bit of barbed irony in there because, of course, Ray was not English. Um, and I think he was making that point. But he did imply that Ray was gullible and stupid for listening to the Inuit. I won't repeat what Dickens wrote about the Inuit, but it was in most extreme racism and ignorance because there was a man that had barely been beyond London. Well, he had actually traveled in Europe, but he'd certainly never been across the, uh, the Atlantic and had absolutely no experience of Inuit, but he gave them such a vile reputation that it, it, it clung to them. Um, he wrote an article about how in the past, there had been big naval disasters where no Englishmen ate each other. And then he wrote a second one, pointing out how foreign navies ate each other in times of disaster. But that was because they were foreign and not British, because we wouldn't do that, would we? Um, Ray responded, um, defending the Inuit, saying that they were the most honest, um, upright people and that if they had, you know, that they had asked this question time and time again, they got the same reply from people that had no connections with each other. They weren't getting together and making up a story. Um, but that only gave him more ammunition to, to then write another reply. And it kept the story going for a while so that he could make money from the uh, magazine that he ran. Now, he, uh, Ray, went to live in Orkney for a, a time, but um, with no family, his wife was wanting to be, a, well, not in Orkney, basically. So they moved to London for Edison Gardens, and that's it there, and there is actually a plaque up to him now, which was put up a few years ago. Uh, and that is where Ray died. Now, the sad thing is that Ray's reputation was destroyed by Lady Franklin. Um, she had managed to, through friends in high places, he was airbrushed out the histories. You pick up any book on Arctic exploration, it hardly mentions Ray. Ray mapped about 1,750 miles of Arctic coastline that had previously been uh, unmapped by Europeans. Now, that means you have to travel all the way to where the last person stopped and then start to map. Um, he was quite incredible, but he was the only Arctic explorer in the Victorian period who did not receive a knighthood or indeed any awards at all from the Crown. and. Uh, the discovery of the fate of the Franklin expedition, although he did receive the 10,000 pounds, which he split with his men that were on the expedition, um, they, <clears throat> they got that money. So there was a, you know, an admission that it was him that brought the, the story back, the news back. But it was McClintock that they had decided was the hero of the piece, and he received the knighthood. And uh, Lady Franklin pushed to have a, a memorial, um, and we should get onto that in a bit later. So basically, Ray also saw his own discoveries being credited to um, Royal Navy map makers as well. So on maps, there would be, it would claim that somebody else was the, the, the had mapped that area. And Ray had complained about it and had threatened to go to the Times newspaper. Um, and so they ended up having to put paste about paper along the bottom saying that it was found, you know, the discovery was by John Ray. Uh, so basically, they did a number on him. He became a nun man 
a lot of the uh, people like you know McClintic who owed everything to him because he pointed out where to find the, the place that the bodies would be there where the boat was um, he would ignore him after that he would blank him um, he was still highly regarded by the people in the um, in the Royal Geographical Society film um, so as an old man he um, he was still incredibly fit. He went to a shooting contest, I think in Kent, and uh, he shot there and, you know, taken a prize. And then they said, are you getting a carriage back to London? And he said, oh no, I'll walk. He's in the 70s here. Yeah. I'll walk, it's only 40 miles. So off he went and he walked home. Incredibly fit man. But he died on the 22nd of July, uh, 1893, so just short of his 80th birthday. And he died at home holding the hand of his wife. Uh, the two of them were very, very much in love. And he had made no provisions. He had made, expressed no um, desire to what to do with him after he had died. Uh, the only instructions that his wife kept was keep it cheap. Didn't see the point in having a ex big expensive funeral. He said, just keep it, keep it cheap. But she had his body sent home on, uh, well, by train to Aberdeen from a small chapel uh, near Addison Gardens when they lived in London. When the coffin came out, it was a private family affair. It was lined by members of the Royal Geographical Society. He was the he had won the the Founders Gold Medal there. I mean, he was well respected, um, and a lot of them turned up to show the respect, which is nice. Um, he was taken by train to Aberdeen and then by paddle steamer, the St Magnus, uh, to Orkney, where he was met at the pier. Where you landed. Uh, when we were in Kirkwall and he, <clears throat> his body was carried up the street in procession. The town council had said that it would be a nice show of respect if people had uh, kept the shops closed, but they had no authority to order them to close the shops, but everyone did. All the shops were closed. It was a Saturday afternoon. All the blinds were drawn on the shops. And as they processed up the street, the bell of St. Magnus Cathedral tolled the whole time that they, the coffin was going up the street. And he was, uh, well, it's just a couple of shots of the cathedral, you've seen that though. But he was buried uh, along the, the back wall, so third from the left from the back wall. Uh, his wife had that cross put up, saying that he was the discoverer of the fate of the Franklin expedition. Now, we'd been banging on about him in Orkney for decades. Uh, nobody really, well, local Orkanians knew about him, but nobody else did. Um, or oh, this statue of him, this memorial, was raised by public subscription and was erected in 1894, the year after his death. But it was really Ken McGugan, um, journalist from Calgary, I think, originally, but lives in Toronto. Uh, he wrote this book, Fatal Passage, because he discovered the story of John Ray for himself and, uh, and wrote this a wonderful book that I really highly recommend uh, if you get a chance to read it. Um, and it told the story and it, it brought it to the attention of a lot of a, another generation. And that is Ken and his wife, Sheena, uh, with a plaque that they erected uh, at the spot where Ray first saw Ray Strait. So there was Ray, there was uh, uh, Inuk, and uh, Ichibwa Cree were the three men that stood there and saw that piece of water. So Ken lugged this plaque up to, to uh, mark the spot. And there was a, a statue erected in Stromness, and uh, that is Ken McGugan with it. Ken and me are old pals, and he also travels to Adventure Canada quite a lot. Now there was a bit of controversy here because there was a, a, the bicentenary of uh, his birth in 2013, 
saw the statue being erected. There was an academic from Canada who was furious at the claim that he discovered the only navigable link in the Northwest Passage. And um, then he got word of the fact that they were going to put a plaque to him up in Westminster Abbey. And he intervened in order to have that blocked. Uh, it did go ahead. Um, just, there we go. It did go ahead. But it lies underneath um, Franklin's memorial. Now, Lady Franklin was given permission to put a plaque up. She had a whole marble bust of Franklin and a big plaque underneath, saying that he discovered the Northwest Passage because if it existed, he would have found it. Simple as that. Uh, underneath, there is a um, plaque to uh, Leopold McClintock, who, as you can see there, was the discoverer of the fate of Franklin in 1859, five years after Ray found out. And then Ray gets the little cartoon, one on the floor, saying, John Ray, 1813 to Arctic Explorer. Um, so there is still a lot of prejudice against him. Now, and that is myself, Ken McGugan, and Bryce Wilson, who used to lecture. He was my boss at the museum. He's an artist as well, illustrated my book Mermaid Bride through there. But um, but he was the person going around giving talks about Ray in the 80s before it became fashionable. Um, <clears throat> and that's just the inside of the whole cluster and you saw the state of it the other day. But just to wind this all up, um, there was a, a filmmaker called John Walker from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, he made a film called Passage, which was based on Ken McGowan's book. And at the same time, there was a screenplay writer who had written a movie about John Ray, and they had some of the actors that would appear in it. It was never made, sadly. But uh, this would have been about 2006. 2007, they were in Orkney. So I was filmed for the for the movie and all that, and then we went down to London for an argument around the table at the, in the Admiralty Building, and um, that is Tagger Curley, the Inuit politician there, and um, so we went for the read through of the screenplay. And some of us were there, Ken McGugan was there, it was people that were experts. I was the expert on Orkney and ghosts, basically. And the actors who had been reading the pieces, the man that played Dickens said, what I don't understand is why did Charles Dickens side with Lady Franklin? I mean, he was almost a man that was seen as being the sort of champion of the underdog. And so why, why was he on the side of the, of, of the wealthy here? And John says, well, I can't answer that, but there's a man here that might be able to, Cheryl, uh, Gerald Charles Dickens, um, Dickens's great-grandson. So that is Gerald there. And Gerald is an actor, and he actually does readings of, of Dickens. Um, so he travels around the country being his great-grandfather. And uh, Tagak was up on his feet and he was saying, your grandfather insulted my people. He made them, you know, he, he blackened their reputation. Well, he actually, the first thing he said is, hello, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm one of those savages that your grandfather wrote about. And he was sort of like saying, oh, well, you know, sorry. Um, and then Tagak was obviously upset. So Joan called a little break and I spoke to, a slightly confused Gerald outside, and I said, look, I'm no expert on the matter, man, but I had heard that if in any culture, if you insult somebody, then that feud can carry on going for several generations, but it can be stopped at any time if there's an apology. And I said, he is genuinely upset. You know, you think it's just kind of like, ah, you know, I'm sorry about that and you all have a bit of a laugh about it and all. No, I said, he's still hurting. And the, the people are still hurting because of that. So then when we reconvened again, um, 
again, Tagak was up on his feet and, you know, defending his people. And Cheryl gave him a proper heartfelt apology on behalf of the Dickens family for the harm that his great-grandfather had caused the people all those years ago. And he got up and he said, this is more than I could ever hope to have got. I will bring back your apology to my people. And he was saying, Ken and Tom, you, if you're in Nunavut, you are welcome to come and visit me. And, uh, and he said, and Gerald, you are also welcome in my home as well. And it was like witness in history. There was that, that, um, that circle had been closed and that old wound that had been festering for so long had been healed and Tagak was able to go home and uh, with that apology and to begin a new start as well for his people. So that's it folks, that's all I've got to say. I have. Very happy to answer any questions that anyone has. there was that Lady Franklin was friends with him until the report came out um, and did she blame Ray for it? Absolutely because she thought that even if he'd known that he shouldn't have written it. It should have been kept quiet for himself but he was trying to keep it quiet but unfortunately somebody probably just to spite Lady Franklin decided to release the thing unedited so yeah, there had been a friendship there, but it very quickly soured. Yeah. Um, in the church, he found his wife in Toronto in the church. He was living in Toronto at that time. Yeah, he lived in Canada. I mean, until he came back over to, to Britain after his marriage, but uh, he, he just remained in, in Canada. Um, we think that after the reports in the paper and the backlash against them and the waves of hatred and the fact that, you know, people wouldn't speak to him after that. People who he'd That's been on good wrong. terms and refused yeah, to speak uh, to him. Uh, he had, seems to have had a nervous breakdown. And he had family living in Canada because his dad was a bloody good Hudson's Bay Company agent. So he signed up his other two sons as well. And he went to stay with his, his brother Tom in Toronto. And, uh, and just like I said, seems to have had a nervous breakdown. And uh, there are stories about him going through the streets um, shouting at imaginary dogs like he was on a, a, a dog sleigh um, he just he completely cracked up and uh, but then when he was starting to you know become himself again he was at church one day and he noticed this pretty Irish girl and because um, her father was uh, in the army and uh, was Irish but uh, so the, he caught her eye and obviously he caught hers as well so that's why they ended up marrying but she was more happy in London than she was living at Burston House outside Kirkwall. Yeah. Yeah the question was did Amundsen acknowledge Ray's uh, contribution to finding the Northwest Passage through that link. Yes, he did. Uh, he had read, read Ray's account when he was a lad, and he said that it was Ray that inspired him to become an Arctic explorer. And also, it inspired him to learn from the indigenous people rather than lording it over them. Uh, he he went and stayed with them on, um, when the, the Joe was uh, was icebound, 
So, I mean, that channel is only open at certain times of the year. Obviously, a big difference between now and back in the mid 1800s. But it was never going to be anything that was commercially viable. You'd only be able to get small boats through there and pull small ships, and you, you might end up with them being stock. So um, it was uh, it, it was not it was not the big shortcut that everybody thought it would be. But certainly, Amundsen respected Ray, acknowledged his uh, influence on him as well. Controversy kicked off in 2013 when it was the bicentenary of Ray's, Ray's um, birth. Um, it would have been 2014 that the plaque went into Westminster Abbey because I was asked to go down and say a eulogy to, to Ray, but I was actually laid up with a, a fluey cold at the time and hadn't looked at my mobile phone in weeks. Uh, so, no, well, yeah, I mean, I was shocked that such a controversy was kicking off. And that, you know, it's, it seemed like we hadn't really, hadn't really got very far, you know, we hadn't moved on much. Um, but the guy was saying, what a shame they hadn't spoken to him first because he could have changed the inscription on the statue in strongness and I thought I would like to see you try boy you'd get your lugs to had as we say slap. Uh, well it means when you get slapped around the, uh, the ear <laughs> and then you're like <laughs> he's an academic in the university um, Why was he trying to prevent the plaque being made? Because as far as he was concerned, um, Franklin was the discoverer of the Northwest Passage, and uh, uh, Ray, while he did a lot of good work exploring, um, he never claimed to have found the, the Northwest Passage, Ray. He did use his reward money to build a ship about the same size as the Cho, as this Amundsen's ship which um, was speculated that he may have wanted to make that trip. Um, but that is pure speculation. The ship was made, it was late in the year when it was ready, and he, to make some money, because he was you know, running out of funds, released the ship to be used on Lake Superior, and it was wrecked in a storm, it was lost called it the iceberg um, and it went down I'm afraid so um, and of course it wasn't insured so he he lost the reward money and such like. but he never made any claims but he was quite a modest I mean he liked to be acknowledged for what he had done he didn't like it when other people were attributed to his discoveries but he wasn't the sort of guy that would have been walking up and down beating a, a big drum and declaring his genius, you know, or, or how good he was, uh, so, yeah. Any other questions? Well, thanks very much for coming, folks. It's been lovely to see so many. And, uh, thank you.